Well, it's wonderful to have you all here this morning, and we're really looking forward to a wonderful day and seeing what God has to do with us individually. It's my privilege this morning to introduce to you Dr. Ken Eldred. Ken is a, an amazing man. Let me talk a little bit about his business. He was the Retail Entrepreneur of the Year for San Francisco and Silicon Valley. He founded the company InMac, which was a mail order computer parts business uh, back in the 80s. Took that up to $400 million and took it public. Maybe you'll talk about that a little bit. Then reinvested that money into a software startup company called Ariba. And it went public at six billion, yes, that, that's a, with a B. And uh, I'm an investment advisor, so I've kind of been tracking Ariba. And, and up about 2000, I think it hit a high point of $40 billion. And he is a humble man of God. I think you're going to find that as he comes and speaks with us. Wonderful uh, family. Ken, please join us on the platform. Well, the value of Ariba was overstated as is the value of my presentation this morning by Craig. And I appreciate that very much because, you know, sometimes it helps to, to get a, a, a strong start, and he has done that for me. We're going to be talking about the integration of work and faith. You know, let me just give you a little bit of background on myself. I was a newly and fresh minted MBA from Stanford University. I felt like I knew everything there was to know about business. You know, it was sort of like, you know, geared up in a cyclotron and blown out to hit a target. And it was, uh, it was a, and it's, I was not a Christian at that time. I was, uh, but I thought I knew everything. And uh, went to work for American Standard where I was involved in the acquisition team. And on the acquisition team for, we were buying a lot of companies at the time, and uh, I, my responsibility is for marketing and strategic uh, evaluation of the company and its strategies position. And as I did uh, look at this, I, uh, was, I, was, I, I went to the business plan, which was a five-year plan, and the first thing you do is kind of open it up and look at the mission statement. I mean, what are these people all about? And the first thing I read was to glorify God in all that we do. I was shocked. I said, what are these people, nuts? You know, what's wrong with these people? And I was really concerned because I thought, How, this, is not a, this is not a church, this is a business. And I went to my, my immediate boss and I showed him this. And he, he actually turned slightly white and he thought, uh-oh, we got a problem here. So we agreed, I'd go back, finish reading the documents, and see if there was anything to be really worried about. Well, by the time we got through with the analysis of the company, we decided that it was actually a pretty good company. It was pretty well run. It had a pretty good plan other than that. Uh, and uh, we, we bought, the, bought the business. Uh, but it sure got me to thinking a little bit. And uh, the, the issue was, you know, what is, what, what is this thing about God? And what is the, the relationship between, uh, between the Lord and, and business? I, I had no idea. I wasn't even walking with the Lord. I, I came to Christ a couple of years later, and through a series of events where the Lord was speaking to me, and you know, I was arguing with him and had no idea who I was arguing with, actually. But when, when I got to that point, I said to the Lord, look, I, I, you know, I want to commit myself to you, but uh, I really want to be in business. And we had a lot of conversation about this sort of thing. I did. Uh, and one day after you know, roughly three years of trying different ideas and business opportunities that all failed, uh, yeah, and it's important to recognize that failure is a part of success. You know, I was sitting with a friend, and we were thinking about business activities. And he said, well, I've got an idea. He said, I'd like to start a, you know, he said, I think we should start a business. I said, no, I, I'd rather do the MBA thing, and that is buy a business with no money, because you learn how to do that in business school. And I, it didn't work, but we thought it would. And he said, he said, well, what else do you have to do today? And I said, well, actually, nothing. I have no, no commitment. I have no, no work, nothing. I'm out of a job. And he said, well, let's go through these. 
And he began going through a half a dozen different ideas, one right after another after another, and about, uh, you know, I guess we were sort of into a number three or so. I hear this voice that says, that's it. And, I, and I'm sitting here thinking, who said that? And I'm looking at my partner, my friend, and he's, he obviously didn't hear that voice. He, yeah, nothing stopped him. I'm stopped dead in my tracks. And I'm trying to process what this is, and he just keeps going. And finally, it struck me, you know, the Lord's speaking to me, and he's telling me that's the business idea he wants us to do. And I would, so I said, stop, wait, go back, go back, go back, that one. That's the business we're going to do. And uh, he's, he said, okay. We sat down and pressed and pulled on the concept, and uh, that was uh, Inmac, which is a company that when we sold it was that re revenues were $400 million. You know, and it, it, was, it was an experience that I had, you know, I mean, if, if God is not of business, then what is he doing talking to me about business opportunities? So, I, and I was still struggling because in church you get this view that you know, business is something that has really nothing to do with, with, with church. And I don't think it's because pastors don't know anything, you know, don't, don't, believe, you know, don't believe in business, but oftentimes it's, they know nothing about it. They really have no experience. So their view is, well, profit's probably a bad thing because that's what people say in the social world. So you business guys and gals, you give your money, and what we'll do is we'll bless it, launder it, make it good and right before God, and then we'll, we'll use it for God's purposes rather than those evil purposes that it came from. You know, so in the process, I was going through this, and I'm thinking, you know, we're, the company wasn't even a year old. And we were, our revenue, the whole idea was, uh, in those days, was to deliver, ship the very day the orders got uh, made. Nobody did that in direct mail. I mean, back in the time we started this company, it was, oh, they'd get around to it in six to eight weeks. And then whatever time it took to get there. I mean, in those days, you spent 12 weeks waiting for something to come from a direct mail company. Well, we wanted it to be there the next day or within a few days right after that, depending on where they're located in the country. So at the end of the day, everything that we had orders for were shipped. That was just the strategy of the business. So we were really focused on sales, revenue per day. And revenue per day was getting up to 23, 2400. You know, one day we had a $2,500 a day, and we're thinking, wow, this is really great. It's starting from nothing and really moving along. And then all of a sudden, it started to drop. You know, and it was going from 2,500 down to 2,400, down to 2,300, down to 2,200. And I went home to my wife, Roberta, who I wish could be here because she's such an important partner in my life. And I said to her, you know, honey, there's something wrong. I, I don't know what it is. I think God's getting my attention. Maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this. Maybe this is wrong before God, that business is not something I'm supposed to do as a Christian. And I just want to know. She said, well, what's the issue? And I want to know if I'm really supposed to be here or not. She says, oh, well, then why, why are you feeling this way? I said, well, our sales are dropping every day. And she said, well, look, let's, uh, God's, you know, perfect number is seven. I said, yeah, 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 I'd, I've learned that already. I'd learned a few things, and that was one of them. And she said, so let's pray for a $7,000 day. But you business folks, you know, you understand. I mean, you're going that way, and this is something you've never seen by a factor of three. You know, I, I'm actually blown over, and I, but I'm the spiritual head house. I, I knew that was the role I'm supposed to play, so I'm kind of stiff upper lip trying to, yeah, okay, okay. And she said, but you know, that could be an accident, so let's pray for three of those. And now I'm really blown away. And I, I'm not sure know how to respond when she says, well, I'll tell you what, let's pray about this for 10 days and ask God to tell us what to do, you know, to respond to us. So we began to pray, and I thought, what a, what a relief, you know, 10 days, you know, I don't have to worry about this for 10 days. The 10th day, I've got to do something about it. Uh, and as we began to pray every day, the, at the beginning, I was really worried. I thought, what is God going to do? I mean, this is, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Uh, in about five days, I thought, well, you know, if this is what God wants me to do, he has something better. And as time went by, uh, you know, we got closer to the end, it was, I was starting to think, you know, I think God's going to do this. Meanwhile, sales were dropping every day, you know, $1,700, $1,600 a day. You know, really. <laughs> and I walked into the office. As it turned out, the 10th day was, was Sunday night. And as I got up from prayer with Roberta, I said, you know, hon, I think God's going to give us a $7,000 day to tomorrow. I mean, I, 
no, no reason to believe it other than just I felt that's what he was saying. So I walked into the office and I said to my four people, I had a staff meeting, pulled them in and I said, look, today we're going to have a $7,000 day. And they looked at me and thought, I mean, the expressions on their face were priceless. Yet one of them sort of, Eldred's cracked. You know, another one, where did I put my resume? You know, I got to get out of here. I mean, that was the thought process. And other people smiling going, oh, no, here we go. Well, day went along just beautifully. About, five, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, my customer service, I told her, by the way, that if she got, the phones got too busy, just signal me and I'd be, I'm right there in front of her and I'll take up the call. You know, well, she smiled, thought that was pretty funny because, you know, we weren't getting very many calls during the day. But you know, one, right after another, after another, after another. And she even tried to talk me out of this by saying, you know, we could have a $5,000 day today. I said, no, $7,000 day, Nancy. And as we went through the day, at, you know, it was 5.30 in the afternoon, we got a call from Hawaii. Now, we're in California, so it's 3.30 in Hawaii, and they ordered something. Well, the whole team's excited. And we're a computer company, but we didn't have a computer, so we were using a 10-key adding machine. And probably <laughs> some of you don't know what that is, but you know, it, so, and Nancy, our customer service rep, was really good at this, and she added these things up. You know, she did it twice. Went through the no, nobody wanted to look at the totals until we got through. She liked this, and with the two red totals, it said seven thousand dollars. I was just blown away. I was so excited. I picked up the phone and I said, Roberta, guess what happened? She said, I know, you had a $7,000 day. Now come on home, the kids need you. <laughs> the following Monday we had another one, the Monday after that we had another one. And then it went right back down to $1,600 a day. You know, the thing that I learned was that, for me, I didn't care whether we were down there. What I cared about was this is where God wanted me to be. This is where God wants us. And there's so many of us in the room that don't really know is it really true that God wants me in business because is business spiritual? And the answer is yes. It, it really is. It's this, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. By the way, uh, after the $1,600 day, we ultimately sold the company when it was running at $1.6 million a day revenue. So let's examine kind of how we think. You know, how are our lives organized? We tend to organize ourselves in compartments. We compartmentalize our lives. Why? Because everything seems to have different objectives. And we're in church, you know, we think of, we, we have one you know, set of friends and they have a set of views and objectives in their lives and then we, and, and you know, it's kind of, a, you know, a love, love fest uh, in the morning with friends that we know there. And then we go to, um, you know, we, we look at some other sphere. For example, you know, we, we look at our, our work digitally impaired here. Anyway, we look at the work compartment and we say, well, that's got a whole different objective. I mean, an objective is, is uh, about profits, about you know, getting things done, accomplishing things. The other tends to be a fuzzy sort of love relationship. And then we got family and it's kind of like connected to the church a little bit, but there are different objectives and there are different issues. And if you ever wonder on your way to church in the morning, when I mean, my kids were little, it was, shut up, be quiet, get to get going, quiet. And by the time we got there in the morning, it was, Oh, hi, everybody. Isn't that great? Come on, kids. Let's get inside. We don't want to look like we're having a problem in our family. You know, so there's even little differences and nuances there. And then you get into uh, the area of political. Well, you know, everybody knows that business, religion, and politics don't mix. You just don't do those at the same time. You know, so we've got very different objectives for areas. And so how could they possibly relate it, be related to each other? But, and oftentimes you'll be in church and you'll be surprised by the, uh, the fact, you'll, you'll look up and you'll see an associate that you've seen in business. You go, how did that, how did that guy get in here? What is he doing here? You know, because it just seems like it's a whole different interest level. Here's why it looks this way. What we do is we compartmentalize things because we have a couple of trees in our lives. For example, if, you know, if school or work or whatever it is, you know, the objective is to maximize something, particularly in work. You're going to maximize. I mean, that's, that's the macho. That's the term. You know, whereas in the church, it's really not that. It's, it's sort of faith. It's sort of a fuzzy thing that we're learning about Jesus. We're learning about God. We're learning about, you know, how to be different people as we're in that pew, but not necessarily what we do on Monday. 
it seems like a whole different thing. You know, in church we're busy loving others while, you know, in the area of business we're busy maximizing objectives, or whatever those can be. You know, and we, we, we look at business and we say, with the exception of an occasional prayer and a little bit of guilt about not talking about Jesus, you know, we, we do what we do over there. And it seems to have little, you know, our faith really has very little effect in the rest of our lives. And this situation is really costing us. It's impacting us much more than you'd ever imagine. You know, we're paying a huge price for this. George Barna in 2011 did a study and he found that 84% of people between the ages of 19 or 18 and 19 to 29 years of age have no idea how the Bible has, has any impact on what they do. I mean, nothing. Think about that. It's just a totally different area. And what happens as a result? You know, the, we are starting to see a reduction in church. People don't come to church because what has church got to do with what I do in work, you know, my life? What has it got to do with my life? Nothing. It really doesn't seem to be important. Everything that I do in church is sort of, you know, irrelevant to the, to the life that I, I'm involved with. I know that you know, I have uh, responsibilities for things, but, but uh, you know, and, and even in church, if you think about church, how many of the churches that you are involved with actually have a goal? What is the role of my church? You know, ask your pastor. Look at it. Look at your bulletin in the morning. Where does it say at the top of the bulletin? This is our objective as, a, as an organization. What are we attempting to accomplish? You know, there are a few things I'd like to propose, suggest that they that are a part of what we are to do, you know, as a church. And let's try to spend a minute or two and define what the church is. I think it's really important because if we don't understand what the church is, how can we possibly understand the role of business, you know, and understanding what these things are? So the first one seems to be proclaiming the good news, and we have scripture to support that. Uh, you know, it's uh, go and tell into all the world and preach the gospel, you know. Pretty straightforward. Jesus told us to do that, you know. And uh, the we, we're told by uh, the Lord that we are to serve others. And in James, it says that we are to care for the widow and the orphans, you know. And that's a responsibility to have. So that's kind of what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to. There's kind of a serving component in church, you know, as part of that. And then there's the discipling, go and disciple others. So, kind of, you know. How are we doing about these things? How are we doing in these specific areas? For example, in the area of, uh, you know, discipling, you know, how many, do you realize that church growth in the United States, churches would grow if for every 20 people in the church, they brought one new member every year. Church would grow. How are we doing there? You know, think about your own church. How, how fast is it growing? How well is it doing? You know, because this is part of what it is, is proclaiming the good news, bringing people. I mean, I don't mean people switching churches. I mean people coming in because they've got it, the light turned on. And in terms of serving others, you know, how's the divorce rate in the church? How are we doing there? We're not doing too well. You know, so we're not even doing these things. And then the area of, finally, there's uh, discipling, you know, others. You know, how many people are we discipling on a regular basis? I mean, not just telling them about Jesus and walking away. How many are we actually helping in these areas? And then finally, there's this area of serving, you know, uh, glorifying God in the process of all this. So, but these are the objectives of the church. And the church objective really should be this, to glorify God in all that we do. As Steve said earlier today, it's turning the light on God in all that we do. That's what the role of the church is. And it's really important to understand that. So we are to proclaim the good news and we meet the needs of people. And what does, that, what does that lead us to? If we were to write one single statement of objective, what would it be? Well, here it is. This is what I think it is. Consider this as an option. You know, the whole idea is to serve others to the glory of God. Would that be a good statement? Think about that. It's, it encompasses all of these things. 
you know, it's equipping the church. It's the idea of serving. Serving is what brings people on. Kelly's Heroes, the whole idea that came out this morning. This is what it's about. This is what the church is about. So now let's take a look at business because we're trying to understand if, if in our, uh, in, in our, in our lives, if, if we are being driven by objectives, and church is this way, God is this way, and business is that way, you know, we really have to understand the objectives because underneath all of these things, there are assumptions that we make that drive us into these compartments. So we've got to understand what are the assumptions that we're making. You know, see, the devil's not in the details. He's in the assumptions. You make assumptions, and then you live by those assumptions. They cause real, real problems. So what is the role of business? Well, I don't have the word profit up here, but that's what maximizing is all about, at least in the business world. Now, we normally, because we're a, if you wish, a younger crowd, now, the history of business is not particularly familiar to all of us. But before 1967, 1968, the role of business was a bit different. You know, in 1967, 1968, two professors from a major business school wrote an article that turned the world upside down. They said that business is about maximizing profit. And they said that, that profit was everything, the objective. And, and, and we went from a stock market that said, you know, we really like this company because it generally does well. It's focused on accomplishing its objectives and so forth. And over time, it gets better to a point where if you didn't make your quarterly numbers this quarter, your stock drops through the floor. You know, and every year it's better and better and better results. You know, that's it. You know, and we think of profit as the key to everything. We look at, you know, and there are professors now who are sort of taking the view of, you know, that's nice, but there's got to be something else that's important, you know, because it just doesn't seem very noble. So what about this sort of maximizing shareholder value? Because we like the word maximizing. It's a really powerful word. We love it. You know, so how about maximizing shareholder value? You know, that'd be profitability. Or what about maximizing employee value? You know, there's, or how about customer value? And some of these folks have been doing these kind of things, uh, trying to develop a, an approach like this, and businesses have picked it up. You know, one, one example, and uh, you know, this is like case study, so you know, bear with me, I'm not against the company, I'm just using it as an example. GE had a phrase, a, a slogan, it was, we make good things for life. You know, and you saw it on their logos, and you see companies with, la with these kind of ads, you, you know, uh, logos, and sort of this is our mantra. But the reality is that Jack Walsh said, you know, we make good things for life, but if it's, we're not number one or number two in that marketplace with the kind of profit levels we expect, we're out of that business. It has nothing to do with us. And, and to wit, the light bulb business. GE has been maximizing the light bulb business in terms of earnings for years, and at one of these meetings, I was suggesting that the light bulb was uh, at a point where we were, uh, uh, you know, GE had so failed to invest in it that they'd be out of the business in five years. And this man came up to me and he said, no, I want to talk to you about the GE light bulb thing. I said, uh oh, I've probably said something that's not true. And he said, you know, we're a Christian organization and in three years, we pick up the GE business because they're, gonna, they're selling it to us. And we've been, and they're out. That's exactly right. See, you know, here's, you know, maximizing things doesn't work very well. Let me give you a story of about maximizing profit. There was a, there was a minister of interior of a very wealthy country, and there was a minister of interior of a very poor country. And the poor minister was, you know, went to visit his wealthy associate and uh, country associate, and he went to his magnificent home. I mean, it was beautiful. And he said, how do you afford to live in a home like this? And he said, well, you see that freeway out there? He says, yeah. He says, 10%. Guy sat there, light bulb went on, he went home. About five years later, the minister from wealthy country came to the poor country. And he says, uh, and as he goes to the man's house for dinner, it's not a big, beautiful home. It's a palace. It's magnificent. It's unbelievable. And he looks at him and he said, how did you do that? He said, well, you see that freeway out there? And he said, no, I don't. He said, you're right, 100%. <laughs> see, there's no such thing as maximizing. It is not an actionable concept. You know, what is profit? 
Profit's important for every business. It's like breathing. If you're going to run a race, you have to breathe. But that's not the objective of the race. The, run, the objective of the race is to get there first. Let's assume that you're faster than I am. You run faster than I am, and I'm out of shape, so I'm breathing harder than you do. And when the race is over, the, you say, hey, I won the race. And I say, that's not fair. I breathe more than you did. That's what we say in the business market. So we have lost the idea of what it is to be in business. So let's look at some scriptures related to this. You know, for example, it says that uh, the Son of Man came to serve. It doesn't say serve specifically. You know, that is the objective. That was one of the things he came to do. That's what we should be thinking about. Uh, above all, we, you know, we, we must love each other. You know, love is a key to everything, no matter what you're doing in your life. You know, we, we can certainly look at the scriptures for that. And then finally, we look at this and it says, God said, do, you know, give glory to God in, in all that you do. Now, all this last time I looked in the dictionary meant everything, you know, and it means every area of life. So in looking at and thinking about that, you know, we're also, uh, God says we're to do whatever we do, we're to do to the glory of God. So what is the role of business if these are the things? And let's look at it. Here's the role of business. The role of business is to serve others to the glory of God. Now think about that. You know, think about this. I propose to you that that is the role of business. Now it doesn't mean you make, don't make money. You have to make money. In fact, the idea of profit is a government-generated word. You know, profit versus nonprofit. I know so many people say, well, you know, I want to go into the nonprofit world. Well, you could join my company. You know, it's failing. You know, it's nonprofit. But or, you know, we, we do make profit, but that's not the objective of the company. Look at Steve Jobs at Apple. What did he say? He said, we make cool products. That was the objective that Steve Jobs had for Apple. Well, they made a ton of money. You know, it's you, you, you can't focus on the wrong thing. If you want to see the Pleiades, you look at something else, and they come into focus for you. These things happen as you do the things that serve others, that care for others, that love others, that meet other people's needs. So the whole idea is as we serve in business by thinking about what people need, by loving them, by meeting their needs well beyond what are, is required, well beyond what is required, required by the law, people stop and they say, this is terrific. You know, we had, uh, we had employees and we, you know, we, we were a business that, like everybody else, I mean, you know, we've made mistakes. And my people say, what do we do about that? And I said, and uh, it, what an opportunity. I said, when we make a mistake, not that we want to make mistakes, but when we make mistakes, that's the opportunity to show who we are. People call and they say, you've really screwed this up, you've done this. And so, how can we make it right for you? I apologize. I had no idea we did this. And the, our customer service reps had the right to fix anything any way they wanted. It didn't have to go up to a vice president. Think about this. You buy a toaster, or somebody gave you a toaster as a gift, and you take it back to the store where it came from because there's labels on it. And the, the, the store rep says, well, you know, where's your receipt? I said, well, I don't have a receipt. It was a gift. Well, we can't take it back. Well, the box isn't even open. You sell these things, and I know they bought it here. Well, no, you can't. So you say, well, let me talk to your supervisor. And you start working your way up. By the time you get to the vice president, you are fuming. And he says, yeah, no problem. We'll take it back. And now, now you're upset. Not only did you return the product, but you're never going to go do business there again. And nobody ever stopped to think about how, what you're going through. And what we told our people was think about what they're going through. Understand. He said, well, what if they're lying to us? I don't care. You know, that's, they, that's between them and God. Now, here's the point. When we begin to uh, look at the objective of business, we look at the objective of church, and we realize they're exactly the same. Now, there isn't a, profit, there isn't a church in the United States that will be around long if it doesn't have a profit. We don't call it that. We call it a reserve. We call it some cash in the bank to get us through the summer or through difficult times or to invest in new programs and projects. All of that is profit. That's what companies do too. But the government has made new words for it. New words for it. And if you don't believe me, go to a church that's losing and has a deficit every month. It's not going to be around long. 
You know, so the objective is exactly the same. And if the objective is the same, then now it's an issue of doing something about priorities in our life rather than trying to compartmentalize our life around all of life. Because these objectives to serve God, uh, you know, to serve others to the glory of God is true, whether it's in school, whether it's in work, whether it's in business, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in any field, you pick it, politics. And when we lose this objective as, an org as people, you know, all of a sudden we lose our country. We lose our ability to relate to each other. And this afternoon, as we, or, or later this morning, I'm going to get into part two, talking about, uh, you know, how, what, how does this affect us? How does, how does this idea of understanding the integration of life affect not only the economy of a nation, and it does hugely, but also your own? So as I, th I challenge you this morning, and then we've got a few minutes for questions, I think, uh, to, um, to think about how you compartmentalize your life. What are some of the things that you think? I mean, for example, are you in full-time ministry? If you say, well, no, no, I have a business, you're wrong. You are in full-time ministry. I don't care whether you're in a business or in a church, it doesn't really matter. It is a full-time ministry. You know, what are the areas where you, un you know, consciously are separating pieces out? I encourage you to spend a little time this morning as we, you know, as we go into other things to think about, um, you know, those areas and to try to pull yourself back together rather than being, you know, instead of living integrated lives as we need to be, we're living disintegrated lives. So we need to change that. Craig?